Hi, uh, welcome back uh, to our next event, uh, Indigenous Peoples Foods in the Arctic as Game Changers for Climate. Um, I'm Arthur Ramachandran, um, well, how are viewers? Um, so this event is organized by FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit, uh, Mariana Estrada, Elena Aguario, and Jan Fernandez, um, Lino, sorry, Larry Noah, and Anne Brunel. Um, and so I'd like to introduce Rahul and Tao, um, who will be moderating the session. Thank you so much, Arti, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 
Cryosphere Pavilion, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to the event on Indigenous People's Food Systems in the Arctic as game changers for climate action. My name is Rahul Antao, and I work with the International Fund for Agricultural Development. It's based in Rome. It's one of the sister organizations to FAO. And, you know, as an organization with its own dedicated indigenous policy and its own platform for listening to indigenous peoples, I cannot tell you how much of an honor it is for me to moderate this important discussion today. Through this side event, we will explore the connections between indigenous peoples' food systems in the Arctic particular of biodiversity. We will discuss the different threats that are putting indigenous people's food systems at risk, including climate change and natural resource extraction. And we will hear some lessons the world can learn from indigenous peoples to mitigate the effects of climate change. In addition, we will hear about the challenges and solutions proposed by Arctic indigenous youth to ensure that food and knowledge systems persist for future generations. I would like to thank the audience that is here today in person, but also to all the people online uh, that is watching in this live stream event. Thank you very much for joining us. And without much ado, we're going to now open with a few remarks. So to start with, I would like to pass the floor to Sylvia Khan Motka, who's the chair of the Sami Palo of Norway for her opening remarks. She's not joining us online? Okay. And so unfortunately, uh, we're going to have a switch in position. And so what we're going to do is move to Jan Fernandez uh, from the uh, head of the FAO on Indigenous Peoples to present some opening remarks. Over to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. Silje couldn't be with us, but we have John that is going to help us with the closure. Thank you so much, John, for being here from the Sami Parliament in Norway. So my name is Jan. I'm the head of the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit, and you might wonder why we are so interested in the Arctic. And the reason why we are so interested in the Arctic in FAO is because the Arctic is fundamental for the climate in the planet, it's fundamental for the biodiversity of the planet, for the health of the seas, for all the connections in the cryosphere, and that's why we are here in the cryosphere pavilion, and I want to thank the colleagues managing the Cryosphere Pavilion, it's extremely important that we talk about the ice and the ice covered on Mother Earth. Now, everybody is talking about the Arctic, but not everybody is talking about the Arctic for the same reasons. Many people are talking about the Arctic because they are interested in extracting the natural resource base. They are interested in the Arctic melting. They are interested in destroying the Arctic so that we can have a new trade route and that there can be all the natural resources extracted so that we can maintain this way of living that is taking us uh, to all of us here, trying to fix the planet that we have destroyed. But the reality is that there has been people in the Arctic living there for hundreds of years, thousands of years, that they have livelihoods, they have food systems that are perfectly tuned to the needs of the Arctic and that they are perfectly tuned to the environment and the biodiversity in the Arctic. And we're extremely fortunate to have so many of them with us here today. From Russia to Sweden, from Norway to Finland, from Canada to the US, there is Arctic peoples that have been living in this unique ecosystem. And thanks to their indigenous people's food and knowledge systems, they've been managed to preserve biodiversity. There is a general and extended belief that pristine ecosystems and biodiversity are so because there is no humans there. But this is fundamentally wrong. Many of the ecosystems around the world of high value are so in connection with indigenous peoples living in those territories and managing those resources in a different way. So unless we change our perception of how pristine ecosystems and biodiversity is maintained in the planet, we will not be able to preserve biodiversity. And we have seen this when we create national parks and protected areas, and indigenous peoples are displaced from those territories. And then we see how the natural resource base deteriorates. We see how the newcomers do not understand the interactions between the elements in this ecosystem. So it's a unique opportunity to learn from people that come from the Arctic that are here with us. It's not only for their livelihoods, but it's fundamental for the balance in Mother Earth and in the planet. So thank you so much to all of you for being here. And thank you, Raul, for moderating this event. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Jan. Those were really lovely words. I remember once when uh, I was first learning about indigenous peoples, one of the first things that uh, someone told me is that if you take the map of the world's biodiversity hotspot and superimpose a map of indigenous peoples, you get a sort of clear match, which really makes you think, what can we learn from indigenous peoples? How have they managed to really look at systems thinking from a point of view where it's systemic, where we look at ecosystems and biodiversity as one, where we look at biocultural diversity as one. So we really are excited today to hear a little bit more from our panelists who are joining us so that they can share their vision on how we can sort of connect initiatives at the global level. How can we learn from what's happening at that local level and really scale it up to something that we can sort of take home as well? Um, and so with that, I'd like to now start introducing our panelists one by one. Just before we begin, and uh, you know, as much as we would love for all our panelists to sort of go on talking as much as they can, unfortunately, we also have a little bit of a timeline to cover. And so I'm going to request that you stick within five minutes of your intervention, and I will try and also like point up exactly when we should be closing on each session about a minute before. So thank you very much. And now let's hear from our indigenous superstars. And so before we move on, I'd just like to say that the first panelist uh, who is connecting is online. And her name is uh, Salyana Altasova. She belongs to the Seca people and is part of the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit. Salyana, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Please. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Over to you, Salyana. Salana, sorry, can I just, can, can am I here? Yes, okay. So Salana, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And, uh, you know, welcome to the side event. What we are questioning right now is, we'd like to ask you, what are the connections between indigenous people's food systems, livelihoods, and biodiversity preservation in the Arctic? Over to you, Salana. And let me first introduce about myself. So I'm Sergio Alvatua, and I belong to one of the indigenous people who are living for Sahara people. And I belong to the traditional horse cattle and cattle farmers, the community and families. And my family still. Uh, maintain a traditional livelihood that community here. Yeah. Uh, likewise, I'm also part of the uh, Star Indigenous Unit uh, unit. So could you uh, share my presentation with me? Is it visible here? Yes. Yes. So, uh, I just want to ask our technician colleagues if they can allow me to share the screen and I will share you the presentation. Thank you very much. Just one second. Okay, so what we'd like to uh, tell about like, the connection of biodiversity, food system, and traditional knowledge in the Arctic is that food system in general in Arctic are closely connected with the weather. So it means that each season that we have in Arctic provides different types of uh, variety of uh, food. And so it means that and biodiversity are closely connected with each other, and these activities are based on nature and seasonal changes. And when climate change, it affects seasons and food system respectively. Uh, particularly in Arctic, that cold is of uh, cold is source of our livelihood because cold for us is a uh, road because 
Unfortunately, uh, at least in Arctic part of Russia has really some good like or almost doesn't have uh, infrastructure. So when winter comes, we are getting access to the road, which serves us as a connection with the rest of the world. <clears throat> and um, cold also serves us as a storage of our food products. So it means that we are capable to storage, for example, frozen food, fish like meat for a longer duration. And uh, we also use like a, ice as a drinking water. So it means preserving our food system in Arctic is equal to the preserving of our livelihood and fragile ecosystem. Um, so then, um, and I, I'd like to say that the people who deal with traditional uh, way of life, the first one who are facing impact of climate change, because um, as you know, like uh, around sixty-five percent of Russian territory. is um, permafrost. So it means like our homes are based on permafrost, which is also like melting. So we notice that our fields are becoming swamp and we can't use our like fields anymore like before. And under our underground ice storage start to spoil and we cannot like use it like as longer as before. And um, and our weathers are becoming unpredictable. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So here I'd like to highlight the key initiatives of, uh, of our Indigenous Unit uh, team uh, provide support and outreach related to Indigenous people, including Indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Uh, so, uh, how in uh, three initiatives which are global hub that generates indigenous people knowledge, also indigenous people food system coalition that was done just recently this year, established by government and indigenous people to develop better policies and, and uh, support indigenous people food system. And the third one is a wrong group of friends of indigenous people uh, that, that composed by government's voluntary basis to think about how to support indigenous people in global debate. Next slide, please. So here we also see that uh, some indigenous people unit also have a close connection and relationship with the indigenous people of the Arctic, uh, particularly uh, for highlighting their food system. So in 2019, the FAO hosted expert training on traditional knowledge and, and indigenous people in the Arctic. Then uh, FAO also published the White Power Paper, which also are comprised by uh, indigenous people knowledge and food system, including Arctic. And also, there was a, I would say, a huge work and contribution at the same year when Paul launched Indigenous People to System that portrayed a profile of Indigenous People to System uh, in order to understand how this work and what are specific challenges of Indigenous people. And that's why, like, and uh, after the indigenous peoples uh, are important, like, and after all this done, like, uh, power understand it's important to have more knowledge about food system in the Arctic. And another one activity related to indigenous people issues were like uh, arranging side events like last year during the climate change conference. <clears throat> Next one. So after having all uh, like uh, 
So now uh, we have evidence that we came out from our different processes that power supported. And we have these results as an increase and advance with the mainstream after indigenous people's trade and knowledge system, strength of indigenous people's governance of the traditional territories, increased exchange of knowledge between indigenous organizations in the Arctic on fisheries, hunting, harvesting, and other food security. And then target specific policies for indigenous schools and support the transmission of indigenous people knowledge. Next slide, so indigenous food systems are game changers themselves. But, so that's why I, th there is no need to change. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that Arctic region has a fragile and vulnerable, vulnerable ecosystem that indigenous people who are preserving and maintaining healthy and diverse for, for centuries. And for the covering Arctic, it really it takes ages because of that, and we need to be really careful with the ecosystem of the Arctic. And now, as I already mentioned before at the beginning, the ice is a factor of indigenous people in the Arctic. Ice is a culture, ice is a livelihood, and ice is melting. And that's why adequate local policies are urgent in the Arctic, considering all the priorities of region uh, food system. And I'd like to uh, finish my presentation with a word of my indigenous sister from Greenland that she was sharing between the and fisheries in the Arctic that our kids won't have the same childhood as we had, but despite we're not that old to tell this world. Thank you for your attention. Check. Okay. Thank you so much, Saliana. Thank you for joining us and thank you for that presentation. Uh, yeah, we had a little bit of an IT problem, but we're so happy that we gave you a little bit more time to finish that presentation. It was really interesting that you brought out these issues of how we look at knowledge and how we look at action, and particularly looking at how the two sort of ex in interact with each other. You know, and particularly on knowledge, how it's not just about some of these how to do manuals and you know, how we can sort of go about preserving ecosystems, but really in terms of how we can exchange at least at a local level. And the action issues also on multi-stakeholder initiatives on strengthening government, governance systems, and also looking at local policies on the grassroots level. It was really revealing. And I think, you know, to sum up what you were saying that in indigenous peoples are game changers already themselves. And so we really need to sort of run on that wave as much as we can to see how we can build it up further. Friends, colleagues, and everybody in the audience, I'm very happy to also um, inform you that our, our first speaker, uh, Sylvia Khan, has now joined us on, um, on virtually. And so she is the chair of the Sami Parliament of Norway. And we'd like to invite her back right now. And we'd like to give her a few moments to offer her and us some opening remarks. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you very much and good morning. My name is Tine Karimoska and I am the president of the Sami Parliament in Norway. I hope you all are, all are doing fighting at top the development Sharma Shape. I am the Arctic Regions member in the steering committee for the Global Coalition on Indigenous People's Food System. I have been given responsibility as focal point for fisheries matters in the indigenous coalition, and I also participate as a coordinator for research, strategy, and collaboration on knowledge systems. It was a true pleasure for me to join the first ever global coalition on indigenous people's food systems. It was launched at FAO headquarters in Rome in October this year resulting from the UN Food System Summit 2021. There is no doubt that climate change is affecting the food systems of indigenous peoples in the Arctic. Today, we see that the newly published climate report concluded that the warming in the Arctic goes almost four times as fast as on the rest of the globe. 
the Arctic is already on average around three degrees warmer than it was in the beginning of the 80s. This dramatic warming affects and impacts the family way of life, including our traditional livelihood and food production. The fisheries in sea waters, rivers, and farming, hunting, and gathering are under pressure by climate change. I have dozens of examples on how this is affecting us very, very much. We are also knowledge holders and specialists in sustainable use of biodiversity. Our culture and communities are deeply connected to nature and resources. Due to this connection and dependence, we live our lives with respect and harmony for Mother Earth. Our job is to protect the land that ties us to the past and our history. It is the natural landscape that furnishes the basis for our stewardship of resources and our grazing, grazing animals. The land, air, water, oceans, forests, sea ice, snow, plants and animals are the source of indigenous people's values and the land gives us identities that distinguish us as separate nations. Indigenous peoples are also rights holders. We have rights to these areas through our historical usage of our lands and waters. The protection of indigenous land, waters and territories also protect the food systems. We are talking about our common future. Indigenous people's food systems have high level of self-sufficiency. We are talking about local food with short transportation use and that gives a low carbon footprint. And I must also add that it's very healthy food we produce. Uh, and this is what we are talking about. When the seven member states and indigenous peoples from the seven social cultural regions of the world has a need to join forces to respect, to serve and promote indigenous peoples' food and knowledge systems as game changers for the benefit of all humanity. It is about our common future. Olohito, thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was really powerful. And we're very happy that you managed to join us also on this call. Um, you know, we, we, we get your message that, you know, the, the temperature's already risen. We're already at three degrees, but yet there's so much resilience. And we can see that, you know, the knowledge that you possess and the communities that possess, uh, you know, are really sort of deeply connected with nature and resources. And they go sort of hand in hand. And we see you and we see indigenous peoples as the stewards of those resources. And I think one important point that you raised was that, you know, it's from the land which really gives us this identity. And so we really need to sort of continue and sustain and see how we can uh, improve our, our, our work with indigenous peoples, taking into consideration these ideas that you are bringing to the table. We're now moving to our next uh, panelist. And uh, her name is... Uh, Paulina Shulbawea, and she's from the Salgap people with cultural survival specialist. Paulina, would you join us? Join me for a minute here. The question towards you is climate change is already affecting the food systems of indigenous peoples in the Arctic. What are the main challenges in this region? Over to you, Paulina. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, as you know, we're talking about uh, climate change many years, and everyone knows that climate change, uh, Arctic change is much faster than in other region. Some somebody talking about twice, some three times much faster than in other regions, and we have a lot of um, climate change uh, effects on uh, as uh, permafrost melt as. Uh, changes uh, road of wild animals, e everything. But I think in, uh, we should a little bit uh, talking about also what also challenges and what also can affect Arctic 
and can add, and have already affect to our food system and traditional uh, food security. And first of all, what I want to um, think about another challenge is it's uh, industrial development and pollution of our territories. Uh, mineral extraction and, of course, uh, including tra transition minerals for new renewable energy, for new uh, energy technology, which destroyed our territory, which destroyed our nature, biodiversity, and as a result, our food system, traditional food system. Next one, um, uh, it's uh, criminalization and violation. Our activists who advise and who working with uh, protection of our land, our rights to traditional territory, our rights to traditional lifestyle. Lifestyle, is it mean our traditional occupation, rights for fishery, hunting, rights to be rendered herders if, it's, if you want. And unfortunately, uh, this uh, criminalization violation, it's um, have uh, direct link with uh, pollution and industrial companies. Another challenges, if again, these challenges is plus two climate change. Um, another is uh, lack of respect and rec uh, respect and recognition our rights because we are rights holders. This is our land, our territory, our resources, our traditional knowledge, and uh, everybody told that eighty percent of all biodiversity, all food, clear food. It's on the land of indigenous peoples, on the land which indigenous people protected because of the traditional management system. It's the best management system in the world. And of course, uh, food system also it's the best. Uh, but uh, now, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have our territory, but rest this territory, government and authorities, no indigenous peoples. Therefore, I think it's very important it's, uh, that our management system and connection with nature should be fully recognized by government, should be fully recognized um, and, thank you, and recognized and approved as a legal system. Because uh, this is a very important management system and food system should be fully recognized. Um, another, it's, um, I think everybody talking about funds, but it's how it's now situation. A lot of regions uh, have different um, uh, different uh, access to fund. I mean, we have one rights, but why we have different uh, rights for fund? Arctic, it's also one of the seven regions. It should be the same equal rights to the fund, absolutely. And um, this fund should be for documentation, for saving, for protection of our food system, for capacity building uh, and education program of our youth. A lot of projects with our traditional knowledge holders and intergenerational inter transmission between youth and elders and so on the question of um, food, uh, the indigenous people's food systems. It should be and fund should be equal for everyone. Um, Decision uh, participation of our traditional holders' knowledge uh, with in, in the process of decision making it's also very important in our region because uh, when we our system our indigenous people food system it's already basis for achievement development sustainable goals including goals zero hunger we already uh, a thousand years we did this uh, it's, and it's work this is system why we can use this why we need a lot of money for making someone new if we can use knowledge which already here and indigenous ready showing how it's work it's the best practice please use this you can but we should be fully partners and this is also very important and last i wanted to say that um we, as indigenous peoples, we are ready to be part of the solutions. We are ready for this. But uh, our contribution should be fully respectful. And this is very important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pauline. I'm battling with the microphone over here.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Polina. I think, uh, you know, you, you raised some really important issues and points as well. Number one is that rights are very important when we're talking about uh, indigenous peoples and we have to be rights focused. And particularly when it comes to management systems, we have to see how traditional management systems fit in that. Because I think one of the things that you brought out is you, there's no reason to sort of replace things that are already in place. So how can we sort of work with what is already in place? And the last point you brought out was on funds and really how, you know, even we, you can look at in your communities as well, how you can tap into those equal rights towards those funds that are available, particularly towards tackling key issues on climate. Now we have uh, enough time. And so we're going to move to our next panelist, uh, Elvira uh, Kunmen. And Elvira is from the Sami people, and she's the president of the Sami Youth Association. So we're very excited to hear what the young voices of the Sami people have to say. And Elvira, the question to you is, uh, why is the preservation of indigenous people's food and knowledge systems, why are they key for climate action? Over to you, Elvira. We are so short here. So. Uh, yes, are you getting my uh, these pictures that I gave you up on the? Hmm? Uh, yes, uh, like our moderator said, my name is Sara Elvira Kuhmonen. I am 22 years old and from the Swedish part of Sápmi. Uh, I am from a reindeer herding family from uh, Sirigis Reindeer District in Sweden. And uh, like you said, I'm also the president of the Sami Youth Association Saminora, uh, but also vice chair in World Reindeer Herders. Uh, yeah, uh, all over the Arctic, uh, we have reindeer herding. Uh, we are in 10 national states, and it's 24 different indigenous peoples who, works with, uh, who work with reindeers. Uh, we have a nomadic lifestyle uh, and follow the reindeer and the nature. Uh, and of course, like other indigenous peoples, we are affected of the climate changes. And the latest uh, research uh, tells us that the climate warming is happening four times as fast here as in the global average. And uh, here you have the picture of the Arctic and the areas that we have uh, uh, the reindeer herding, and the reindeer herders. Oh, thank you. Uh, and the thing is that we are not only affected of the climate changes, we are uh, hit twice, uh, also by the climate mitigations, uh, when states are trying to go over to green energy, for example, windmills, green minings and forest cuts. Uh, and we live in a very marginal areas. Okay. Uh, we live in a very uh, marginal areas in the Arctic, uh, but the reindeer have been able to live here. Uh, and people can barely survive in this type of environment, but the reindeers can. Therefore, the knowledge that we have is, has made it possible to, uh, for us to live here. So with that, the reindeers makes it possible to us reindeer herders to survive and thrive in this kind of uh, ecosystems. Um, and this, uh, of course, means that we need to take advantage of the traditional knowledge uh, we have gotten from our ancestors, because it's more than only uh, a knowledge. It's about values we have. You don't take more than you need from the nature, how we treat our earth. Uh, when you visit a place, you will leave it like it was before and not in a different way. Um, and it's also about uh, being able to give what we have to uh, future generations. Uh, so these are some ways we're living with the uh, uh, indigenous knowledge in our everyday life. Uh, World Ranger Herders, we were in Rome at uh, this World uh, Food Forum at FAO, where we put up our nomad food lab uh, named Boasho, as you see on the picture. Uh, Boasho has the construction of a traditional lavo, uh, and the lava is, is where Sam has lived in when we moved with the uh, reindeers. But we also do it today, uh, for example, when we have uh, calf marking. 
And the special thing with this uh, lavo is that it's not the normal size of a lavo. It's uh, uh, one of the biggest lavos in the world. Uh, and the thing also with Boisho is that it has a full functional kitchen, as you can see on the picture, this uh, metal thing to the left, uh, where indigenous youth and master chefs can work and uh, cook food. Uh, so we brought this, uh, our food lab, from Kautokeino to, uh, from the northern Arctic Norway to Rome in Italy. Um, and here we create an, uh, created an area, a space for indigenous peoples, uh, where we could gather, uh, where we talked about the Arctic and indigenous food and resilience to climate change. Uh, we had a very hectic uh, schedule in Rome, and the program included all from cooking, uh, demonstrations of traditional foods and dishes, uh, also modern food, uh, preparation, how we process it, and uh, included a diversity of indigenous food cultures. So it was not only the people in the Arctic, we had also indigenous people from uh, South America. And of course, another thing we had was music, because music and food uh, are those two things that people all over the world understand. Uh, you don't have to be from the same indigenous peoples uh, or to understand the languages to understand music and uh, food. And Boisho may seem uh, to be a very simple construction uh, with a traditional lavo. But it, it is also constructed in the way that it can be transported into the tundra, the living system of the reindeer herders and other indigenous peoples. Uh, so it's combined with the traditional setting of a lavo outside it. Um, and here you can see uh, those, like reg those regular lavos uh, uh, on the sides and the, uh, the big, big one, our guasho. Uh, so Boisho is made to inspire indigenous people all over the Arctic and the whole world, uh, where the focus is on accelerating and stimulating the development of new businesses, understanding things in a new way, and also combining innovation and traditional indig indigenous uh, knowledge. Uh, and this is actually something that the youth, the Sami youth in my other organization, Sami Noda, has uh, been requesting. Uh, they want to be able to meet other indigenous people, uh, especially youth, of course, and learn more about food systems and indigenous uh, knowledge. And uh, from my view, this is something that will strengthen the resilience of uh, our peoples and our future, uh, especially when they by themselves uh, see the importance of this. And here you have some uh, pictures when they are working in the uh, Boisho. So here we have uh, the chair of the World Ranger Herders in Granita Smuk, uh, who is uh, cooking in Italy. And here we have Elle Save Goup, who is one of our uh, youth uh, chefs. Uh, she's very talented and had her like master chef uh, cooking in Rome to show up the Sami, Sami food. So why is preservation of indigenous people's food and knowledge system a key for climate action? It is because our values will guide us to a sustainable society and food security. It is a way of preserve indigenous people's food and knowledge system. Uh, and a way to do it is by giving the lands back and let our self uh, with our knowledge manage the land that we uh, are a big part of because we know these, uh, these uh, environments and the nature. Uh, so this is something that's really important for the future and for the humanity. And uh, I think it's really important that it has to happen in the Arctic because we are the most uh, uh, vulnerable actually in this uh, climate change. Uh, so that's a bit about uh, our work and what we see is important with the preservation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elvira. This was really quite an interesting presentation. I think one of my 
big takeaways was also looking at how you presented knowledge as nothing that's also static, but at least how it should sort of evolve also and remain in a sort of dynamic sphere, how you're mixing innovation with tradition and looking at modernity also like, you know, fusing into the, the whole dialogue over here. I, I like the ideas of what you brought up about exchanging and learning also about food systems and knowledge, particularly within indigenous, from between indigenous youth themselves. And, um, and you know, you're right, this really does build a lot of resilience. And I think, you know, the point that you made at the end, it's really that our values is really what is going to guide us towards uh, sort of living in this resilient sort of world that we are looking towards now. Okay, I think Elvira, thank you so much. With that, we have one last speaker left. Um, and we have Vyasheslav uh, Shadin of Yukagir Elders. And uh, are you with us online? Yes. So the question we have for you, now that we've gone from the young people, <laughs> we want to know how can states international organizations and indigenous peoples take collective action to promote the preservation and strengthening of indigenous people's food systems in the Arctic. Over to you, Vyashasla. Hi, everybody. Uh, if uh, we try to ask answer to these questions, I try to divide on three levels. Uh, firstly, about international level. Uh, one of the, uh, our expectation from the COP27, that we uh, come to the real, we try to come to the real results because for many years, we every time meet, every time speak, uh, take many recommendations, but every time it's only like a words. We hope that uh, is start a time when we have must have a real results because the situation start more and more hard. And uh, we hope that this COP uh, make next step to help to our peoples, to our nature in this way. The second, we support that uh, some UN organizations make steps to help our indigenous people in our um, fight with climate change impacts. And uh, one of this is uh, creation, the indigenous people's food system coalition uh, this year and uh, hope that uh, these coalitions uh, take uh, real steps to um, defend our food systems. The next, you know that we have many barriers and uh, last year you see many politicians uh, create new barriers to our collaborations and we must think that all these barriers, nothing must be nothing for us. We, because all problems which we discuss is our common, our life, our common uh, spirit. And uh, all these politicians games and policy must go out and we must think about our earth. And that is why uh, we must think that uh, all the international organizations must provide possibility to all indigenous peoples to take part in all international events, uh, not isolate us and uh, to have real results. 
if we speak another level, state levels, we must uh, uh, ask to our governments that must promote to our indigenous peoples access to their lands and waters. You know that in many places, in many countries, indigenous peoples can this excess. And it means that we haven't access to our traditional food systems. They must recognize our rights in, uh, to our lands, to our waters. And they must recognize it and help us due the conditions of industrial development. Because, for example, you know that Russia, Arctic now in the second, well, uh, second time in the face of industrialization. First was the 50 years ago and now the second because it's some geopolitical situation give us this industrialization. And this uh, greatly impact to our livelihood. And uh, they must uh, understand that, that all the international organization, our states must understand that our livelihood, it's not only our problem. It's the common problem to all the international organization, all the states, because our livelihood uh, is a, one of the way to preserve our nature. Yesterday I say that one of the way is uh, to help to our reindeer herding livelihood. For example, as our researchers say now, uh, need to trampling some uh, Arctic territories, uh, snow causes, uh, because if we be trampling more, it means that uh, uh, more or less uh, melting in the summertime. It means it's more or less melting permafrost, and it means less methane comes to the atmosphere. And this is it shows that that is why it's very for us maybe it's better to put more attention to help for to to support reindeer herding because we have thousand ten many uh, reindeers which can do it and come and give real results to the uh, earth to prevent and mitigate the climate change impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vlasisav. I think the takeaways from that are really that we have to look at meaningful stakeholder engagement and really look at multi-stakeholder engagement. There are many actors involved here and it's about how we sort of come together. The IP coalition that's coming up is really something that should really be looked at as a meaningful way to sort of engage with many stakeholders. And I think one important point you said is that we need to break down the barriers that we have going, the blockers, you know, and if we really want to look at collaboration, then we, we need to look now about how we tackle the issues of marginalization to bring more inclusivity into, you know, the dialogues that are happening. And so the clear message that you're sending us with is if there's a common problem and there is a common problem, we need a common solution and all of us sort of need to come together. Thank you so much, Vlashisav. We have another guest uh, who's here with us in uh, the audience, and that's Aslak from the Sami community. And so we'd like to give you just two minutes, if you can, to share a few words uh, with us. We would really be pleased to help, following which we will then move on to the closing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, yo, 
Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, friends and colleagues, for good uh, presentations. Um, my father was born in 1933, and um, Back then, we didn't have a road coming to, to my region. Um, well, now he's an old man, but uh, let's say still uh, five years ago, um, when the ice broke in our river, then he started becoming very restless. Um, because uh, he had this uh, um, very strong urge to go fish the salmon when breaks that's the thing to do like that's not time to sit in the sofa when, when the salmon starts coming and it was almost fishy that he was not able to sit down at that time and, and uh, this is a reflection he grew up um, and we will have to be able to um, supply ourselves for the winter in order to survive so I think, um, in essence, that's um, also what we have been talking about here today. Even if um, we are, in many cases, part of the market economy, then a lot of our uh, traditions and our food security is still based on the, the very resources that we have and the knowledge on how to utilize them. And as we saw from the examples, the Arctic is going through some dramatic changes and uh, some of our ecosystems and key species are, are collapsing. So when our um, environments are changing, then that, that highlights the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, our knowledge and our participation in the decision making, because we have to adapt when, when our resource base is changing. We have to be part of making the decisions on how do we change, because it means that our cultures are changing as well. Um, I think that was maybe two minutes, so maybe I will just cut and cut down there. And uh, thank you very much, Kate. Thank you so much, Asla. I, I think the real key message there is about adaptation and how we move forward and how we fit and resonate with whatever's in our ecosystem and whatever we are experiencing. So that very well. And I think the story that you also mentioned about your dad was really quite interesting. Also to see how you know that that story flows from there to really looking at how we adapt then with the ecosystem. We've now come to the end of our session. And before we close, uh, we'd like to give a few words of closing remarks uh, to Mr. John Peter Jinder, head of the section of the Sami Parliament of Norway, uh, who I believe is online. Oh, oh, right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Look at that. I missed him right here in front of me. Do, do okay. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, moderator, uh, and thanks for the invitation to, to be here uh, as a representative of the Sami parliament in Norway. Uh, and we heard what my, my boss, the president, Silje Karina Motka, said uh, on her um, opening remarks. Uh, I must say uh, this has been a very good side event. I think the people in the room have learned a lot. We have heard that Arctic is huge. Many different indigenous peoples live there. We are not many, but we have skills to, to survive there. And, and the food system in the Arctic is, is the key for us. And we have a lot of knowledge, knowledge system to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get use of the, the nature to, to survive. Uh, I think also that, uh, that we see that the food system merge many other um, what to say uh, negotiations tracks both here in, in uh, on, on the climate change convention but we also have the same like when we're talking about biodiversity that's important uh, to, to preserve and, and have like sustainable use of biodiversity that goes into that convention Paulina uh, mentioned development important goes directly into uh, to food system and food uh, security uh, and of course we have uh, as we heard here human rights uh, rights to, to land and resource and also governance so we need like to have the indigenous people to live in the Arctic need to have 
good contact with the states uh, so that we can have regulations that support our food systems so that we still can be allowed to, to harvest uh, the way we do. Uh, we also heard uh, uh, that people like to talk about food and, and food and music uh, belongs together and we saw like we can have the best kitchen in the world uh, example of that so so there are many opportunities here for for arctic food systems no doubt about that and of course we like to talk about food and when i ask myself uh, well what are you having to lunch today and i'm saying to myself well i'm gonna have a like an overpriced sandwich uh, <laughs> here in the cafeteria <laughs> with a eco unfriendly norwegian salmon on <laughs> so it's best for us it's the best food you have it when you are home the home kitchen is brilliant in, in my opinion so with these words i thank you all people for coming good to see you thank you so much uh, and i think this is where we close but you know there's so much space to also ask more questions perhaps engage more, more. So I would encourage you all to get in touch with the organizers of this event to reach out to some of these fantastic panelists who you can also get to. And perhaps even after this, for those of you who are available here in the room, to have more exchanges with all the panelists here. Thank you very much, everybody. And this is a wrap and close. And may I ask all the panelists to come together here for a little photo op session with all of us. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.